I'm Francesca Nestor, Assistant Professor in Politics and Government. I'm co-director of the COVID-19 course along with Dr. Kira Bailey in Psychology and Neuroscience. It is my pleasure to welcome everyone back for the 15th lecture in our series. Today, we will learn from Dr. Matt Volrath. Dr. Matt Volrath teaches marketing and branding in the business administration major of the Department of Economics. He joined the faculty in 2017 after more than a decade of work in marketing and communications roles. Matt is the faculty advisor for DECA and the Ohio Wesleyan Marketing Group, OMG, which gives him the chance to help students develop their own solutions to real world business challenges. His academic interests include the evolving role of data in marketing and the relationship between consumers and brand values. As a reminder, you can use the chat function to ask questions throughout the presentation. Dr. Volrath will speak for about 35 minutes and then we will open up for questions. And now, before and after, advertising and marketing in the age of coronavirus. Thanks, Francesca. Um, like Francesca said, I'm Matt Volrath and I'm talking today about advertising and marketing in the age of coronavirus. Uh, I'm excited about this topic because uh, I think it's a really good way for people who have studied marketing and business to see how the many ideas that they've encountered are applied in a real world scenario. And for people who have not studied marketing and business, it's a great introduction. It's a great way to see uh, what marketing is all about and uh, begin to be thinking about why marketing matters, uh, which is actually where I want to start today. Um, there we go. Uh, with the question, why are we wasting time talking about marketing? Uh, I teach marketing. Clearly, I don't think marketing is a waste of time, but I, I do think that in the context of all that's happening in the world, it's easy to perceive marketing as something that is, that's trivial. Um, and I, I would like to argue that marketing is actually something that's, that's really important, even, even in a time like this. Uh, there we go. And the reason is that marketing impacts people's lives. Uh, so the, the, way, uh, the, the way I want to frame this is, let's, let's think about small businesses. I think most of, us, uh, most of us can think of somebody who owns a small business, or maybe you've worked for a small business, but we're familiar with small business. We, we understand that those people are, are doing what they're doing because they believe in it, and they're trying to take care of people they love. It's, it's something uh, personal. It's something that we can relate to. And Small business is a really big part of our economy. So about 60.6 .6 million Americans are employed by small business here in the country. That's almost half of the workforce. Um, these, these are also the people who are gonna be impacted first by uh, a crisis like the one that, that we're facing right now. Uh, so to, to drive that point home, here's a little bit of research from JP Morgan Chase. They were looking at Okay, for, for a typical small business, how long can they survive without cash? How long can they cover their expenses without cash? And what they found was there's a median cash buffer of 15 days for, for most small businesses, right? So what that's telling us is that uh, small businesses are, uh, a lot of them are, are in crisis right now. A lot of them are in a, a pretty desperate situation. Uh, clearly, we've 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 uh, had a lockdown. We had a lockdown for much longer than 15 days, so that put a lot of pressure on on small business in particular. And the point that I'm trying to make here is, you know, a, as we're thinking about small business and those those people who we know, those experiences that we've had, and the value of marketing. Well, the value of marketing is it represents a set of tools that we have to face a crisis like this. So when when we're when we're working for a business or owning a business and you know, our back is up against the wall. We've got this uh, small amount of time to make a difference for, for what's happening. Uh, if, if we have spent some time studying and thinking about marketing, you know, we're maybe we, we might not see the concrete, we might have concrete answers, but we're going to have uh, some pretty solid clues about what we could be doing and what might make a difference for us. So today we're, we're going to be thinking about uh, what's happening in the world of marketing and advertising. This is the outline I'm going to be following. First, we're going to start with some historical perspective. So uh, in, when we face crisis, when there's been a crisis in the past, how have businesses responded? How have customers, consumers responded? Then we're going to look at what's happening right now. And we're going to do that through the lens of uh, the four P's. So uh, I'm sure most of you are familiar with that. Product, price, place, and promotions. These are the, the main ways we have of affecting uh, how successful our business can be and as we're, we're trying to reach consumers. And then we'll end with a a summary where we're just trying to tie it together and draw some conclusions about what 
um, might be effective right now. So historical perspective. Uh, where I wanted to start there with is with 9-11. All right, so obviously 9-11 is not the same as what we're experiencing right now, but there are certainly similarities that, that we can see. It was a really unexpected event. It wasn't something that we had planned for, and it was a nationwide impact where people were uh, feeling scared, people were, were feeling uncertain, uh, they didn't know what was gonna happen next. Uh, so first, let, let's frame this by looking at the Consumer Confidence Index in, in the wake of, of the 9-11 attacks. Uh, Consumer Confidence Index is just a, a measure of how people are feeling about the economy. Are they feeling positive? Are they feeling negative about it? Uh, red line is uh, Consumer Confidence in the United States and black line is uh, an average of uh, some of the other large economies in the world. And what we see is that we, we had a really dramatic drop in consumer confidence after the attacks, but it rebounded pretty quickly, just in a matter of, of a few months. All right, so some other things that were happening in the wake of 9-11, people, uh, consumers were, were searching for things that helped them to feel safe and comfortable and find a sense of stability. And this is a, a quote from a caterer during that time period. And they said, comfort foods have been unusually popular. We're selling a lot of mashed potatoes, macaroni and cheese. People want something familiar, something soothing, right? Uh, so some parallels there, again, with what we're, we're seeing now. We've, we've got uncertain times and people are uh, suddenly much more interested in finding things that can help them feel safe and, and comforted. And the businesses that are positioned to do that well are, are going to do that well. Uh, also, in the wake of 9-11, what we, something that we saw was that businesses didn't stop marketing. Uh, there was an evolution in the way that they talked, but they didn't stop. So on the left of your screen, we have an ad from Best Buy, really simple. At the top it says, as you weep, we weep, as you pray, we pray, as you endure, we will endure. Uh, notice there's no call to action there. There's no mention of products or even you know, what the company does just a logo and this really simple, empathetic, respectful message. And a lot of brands were taking this exact same approach. And then uh, as time passed, really not very much time, you know, with, within a month, uh, brands were, were building on that message. So we have a, this is a screenshot from a, a, a commercial that GM aired shortly after 9-11. And they were continuing with the same idea that, hey, we're trying to empathize with, with consumers and you know, help them feel this feeling of solidarity and uh, you know some some comfort, some reassurance. But they started taking it a step for, further and saying, "Okay, we need to keep America rolling." And part of that is that we keep doing the things that we've we've always done. Which in this case, Jim's saying that means that means buying cars. All right. So we we had this shift from just pure empathy and you know being you know trying to be respectful and have some solidarity in the moment to we have those things, but almost a, a civic, uh, a patriotic type of consumerism, which we could do a whole another, another lecture on whether that's a good thing or not, but that, that is what we saw happening in the wake of 9-11. Okay, so, uh, so summary here, uh, consumer response to 9-11. We, we saw uh, people cutting back on travel, other activities outside the home, like uh, going to restaurants and theaters, similar to what we're experiencing now. We saw people that were seeking out uh, products that give them a sense of comfort and security and stability uh, and safety. And uh, although people pulled back a little bit after the initial shock of the attacks, ultimately consumption increased because people began to view it in part because of, of marketers and in part because of political figures, in part just because of the, the spirit of the time, people began to, to view uh, buying as something that was essential to keeping the economy going. So. Uh, that, that was a consumer response. And then something else that went along with it, we saw an increased demand for luxury brands and for premium goods, which uh, we can explain this in part through something called uh, mortality salience, which is just the idea that when we're reminded that we're going to die, uh, we, we look for things that help us feel better about that. And one response is that people, people try to acquire things that help them uh, feel like they've achieved what they were trying to achieve in life. Uh, so again, we could do a, another whole session about whether that's good or not, but this is what we were observing. Uh, brands, they, they adapted their messaging. So like, like we looked at initially, they were very empathetic, uh, solidarity, respect. Um, and then we it, it moved on to something a little bit more proactive, a little bit more engaging. 
But a critical point here is that marketing didn't stop. Uh, businesses saw marketing as something that was essential to encourage consumers who were a little bit unsure and doubtful about whether it was a good idea to be shopping right now. Um, so, so marketing was encouraging people to, to get back out there, get, get back involved in, in everyday life. And uh, part of that was th there were incentives and special promotions that, that previously hadn't been offered. And a lot of those were, were tied in with, with the events. So you know, maybe there were charitable donations that, uh, that would be made uh, with, with purchases, things, things like that. And we're seeing some of that now with, with the pandemic also. And then finally, something that, uh, that we saw brands paying a lot of attention to was risk management. So especially with their supply chains, but suddenly there was this, uh, this realization that, oh, our, our facilities in any part of the world, and even domestically, we, we can't count on those being entirely safe. And if something happens to one of those facilities, how are we going to ensure that we can continue to serve our customers and get product uh, to them when we need to? And again, we're seeing those same conversations play out during the pandemic. All right, and another crisis that we can compare this to, which again is not this, the completely the same uh, as what we're dealing with, but gives us some clues as the recession. So we had the, the Great Recession most recently. And uh, to frame that, Consumer Confidence Index, again, we see a, at the start of the recession a pretty severe drop in consumer confidence. And, and within about two years, those consumer confidence numbers have rebounded, rebounded and got close to where they had been, but it took a longer period of time, about four years, to, uh, to get above uh, pre-recession numbers. But they, they bounced back. And something that we saw brands putting a lot of emphasis on during the recession was value. And that was done in uh, lots of different ways. So on the left, we have an example of uh, bounty paper towels and they held their price steady, but they started emphasizing that they were offering more of their products. So this extra 20% larger sheets. Other brands, we had Miller High Life. They invested a lot in their brand itself in brand building during the recession. So they, they created this uh, uh, delivery man character who kind of uh, was intended to epitomize you know, the everyman with lots of common sense and a disdain for things that are fancy and overly expensive. And the, the value they were creating was this, this is a brand that is for you, for an everyday person who uh, can't afford uh, really expensive things, but you can, you can still be excited about, about our product. And then Xbox, another example, again, they, they didn't reduce their prices, uh, but they added value to their product by uh, innovating. So instead of it just being a gaming console, this is uh, when it started to become a, a streaming device too. And Netflix started to be something that, that you could use while you were uh, you know, with, with your Xbox. So in these three examples, we see that during the recession, brands, businesses are looking for ways to add value to their products. And the, the reaction wasn't necessarily, oh, we've, we've got to cut prices, but we've got to increase value and make it clear to customers why they would buy from us. So consumer response uh, summary. People are much, much more cost conscious. They're uh, much more, they're doing a lot more comparative shopping, pay more attention to deals. They're willing to, to switch brands. Focus on functional benefits. Okay, so this is a big one. We're going to talk about this a little, uh, this relates to what we'll talk about later. Uh, but in, in people became much more concerned about how, is this product going to do what I'm buying it to do? Is, is it going to do the basic thing that I want it to do? Is it going to do that for a long time? Is it going to do that well? We're, we're less concerned in times of recession with, uh, with emotional type benefits, which is what brands spend a lot of time of, uh, emphasizing in, in boom times. Okay, so emphasis on functional benefits, people were putting things off, cutting things out, skeptical of credit, and at the same time, they, they were looking for an outlet to make themselves feel better about their situation. We, they couldn't afford uh, really expensive things or maybe going on vacation, but if, if a brand can give them a, a small way to splurge, consumers were excited by that. And a lot of brands were very successful that way. Brand response, uh, again, emphasis on value mess messaging, which we were just looking at, an increase in marketing spending. So brand response that I'm talking about here is uh, successful brands businesses that did well through the recession, in general, they invested more in marketing and in particular promotion, special promotions, loyalty programs. They didn't, they didn't cut back on their marketing budget, but they saw that as something that they needed to invest in. Um, and they also focused their resources. 
So uh, whether you're a, a small company or you know, a big brand, it's pretty common to have a, a lot of products that you're offering. And as resources are constrained, you don't have uh, the resources you need to support all of those. So uh, focusing in on the ones that are the strongest and being willing to cut maybe some of those, those lines that uh, aren't as promising. And then looking for alternative ways to help products be uh, attainable for, for consumers. So we saw in the, in the last slide that people were really worried about uh, credit. So what are some alternative ways that we can help people pay? Uh, layaway programs, that's something that, uh, that rose to prominence again. And we're, again, we're seeing some of that in the pandemic. Okay, so that's some historical context. Keep, keep those things in mind, those examples in mind, as we start going through what we're seeing now. And again, keep in mind, we're not saying that, these, that the recession or that 9-11 are exactly like what we're experiencing. Nothing is like what we're experiencing, but they can offer some clues about what might be a good strategy in, in our present situation. All right, so to frame, it, to frame things, we'll start with the Consumer Confidence Index. We can see that uh, since the start of the pandemic, consumer confidence has dropped in a pretty dramatic way. Uh, and we remember that we saw that with 9-11 uh, and with the recession as well. In both cases, they, they eventually bounced back pretty quickly in the case of 9-11. We're, we're gonna talk about this uh, in terms of the four Ps, uh, like I mentioned in the outlines. We're starting with product perspective. And I've included a, a picture here of American cheese uh, singles. And this is a, a starting point because American cheese singles, that's, this is something that had a product that was uh, out of favor. You know, sales were flat in many cases declining. People were, were just weren't interested in this product. It seemed like something that didn't have any nutritional value. It didn't feel very healthy. But uh, since the pandemic happened, uh, sales for American cheese have gone up about 50%. All right, and the reason for that is, there are several reasons for that. One, people, people tend to migrate toward established brands in, uh, during times of crisis. And then going back to our example of you know, post 9-11 behavior, people are looking for things that give them a sense of comfort and stability and safety and uh, you know, an established brand, something that was a part of many people's childhood. That's something that can offer that. Uh, of course, there's also the, the constraints that we were all facing when we were going to the grocery store and not everything was there. So that is uh, certainly part of that equation too. So as we're looking at, uh, at, at what's happening with, with products, one thing I want to help to, to use to help frame this conversation is Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. And basically what the hierarchy of needs is saying is that people have these basic needs that they're always trying to fulfill. And they're going to fulfill them in a certain order. They're going to focus on the things on the bottom of the pyramid first. And once they've fulfilled those basic needs, they'll move on to the higher order needs. And uh, pre-pandemic, most brands, most businesses spend a lot of time emphasizing how their products could help people fulfill higher order needs. But then the pandemic happened and suddenly people uh, were concerned about lower order needs again. So this is, the, this is the hierarchy of needs in the context of shopping at the grocery store. Uh, and how over here on the right, you can see how the pyramid's been shaken up a little bit. So whereas before, people just took it for granted that we could go to the store and we could get what we need. Uh, suddenly that, that bottom part of the pyramid, physiological needs, that's something that we're, we're spending time thinking about. We're, we're stressed about it. Uh, and then safety, again, something that we often took for granted. And we're starting from square, a lot of brands are starting from square one and trying to convince consumers that you can buy from us and this is a, a safe thing. And uh, you know, being in these stores is, is a safe thing. All right. So, this, this framework is, is useful because it's helping us to understand uh, the motivations that have changed for consumers. And this is going to be critical as we, as businesses think about how they need to reframe what their products are and how uh, later when we talk about promotion, how, how we need to be talking about ourselves. All right, so over on the left, living a new normal. This is the final stage of a, uh, so a, a marketing research firm called Nielsen. They uh, established a framework for thinking for to help marketers think through uh, the pandemic and what stages uh, consumers might be in. And right now we're in what they identified as stage six, which is living a new normal, the final stage where uh, 
people are trying to get back to everyday life, but uh, things have changed for them. And people are more concerned about health, they're more concerned about safety, wellness, all of these things. So what this means for products is that we have to think more uh, about this pyramid and uh, the motivators, the needs that people are, are trying to, to satisfy. All right, so maybe, uh, let's use for example, uh, a paper towel, you know, um, a company that's selling paper towels. And maybe before the pandemic, uh, they positioned themselves as we are a, a sustainable paper towel company. All right, our, our paper towels are made from 100% recycled and uh, sustainably sourced material. Okay, well now, because people are more concerned about lower order things, it's, it's gonna be important to place more emphasis on the basic job that a product is doing. Okay, people are, yes, they still care about these higher order things, but before, before they're willing to uh, really put thought into that, they need to be sure that the things that they're buying are going to do what, they can, what, what, what they're expecting them to do. Okay, the, the, the lower order needs are being met and that they're going to be helping, uh, helping them live a, a healthier, safer life. Okay, so uh, instead of emphasizing the sustainability aspects of those paper towels, that product might be reframed to talk about how it's helping uh, somebody to, you know, to keep their kitchen uh, clean and uh, their home a healthy environment. All right, so this could mean changes with packaging uh, and, and advertising as well. And we can think in the same way about most any product. Um, okay, so this, this is a, a little quote talking about uh, courier del uh, delivering, uh, delivering meals. Uh, and this article was looking at meal delivery in China during the pandemic. Since scooter riding couriers from online food retailers present customers with a reassurance guarantee slip that includes details of the body temperature of the cooks, food packagers, and couriers for every order, as well as their daily disinfecting routines. Okay. So people are really worked up about, you know, is this food that I'm eating safe? Uh, is this, is this going to be okay for me? Can I trust it? We, we need to start thinking about, businesses need to start thinking about uh, their product as something bigger than just the thing itself. We're not just selling the food in this situation, but the entire experience is what the consumer is buying. Okay, the, the product is bigger than the product itself. And we have to think about how uh, we can create value and reassurances for consumers at, at every stage of their experience with us because the product is bigger than just the actual thing that they're consuming. This is a good example of that. Um, something else that we see happening is that uh, just as in the recession, businesses are starting to trim their product lines a little bit. So one thing that McDonald's has done in response to the pandemic is they pulled their, their all day breakfast menu. You can't get breakfast all day at, at McDonald's right now. And they did that because uh, they were facing financial pressures, they were facing supply chain pressures, and in order to make sure that they were delivering good service and good quality products uh, across the board, they had to focus their resources on uh, a smaller a smaller list of products and lots of businesses are having to make those same choices something else that's really important that's happening in in terms of product is that people are switching they are they are switching brands in ways that they they haven't before okay even in normal times uh, research says that only about eight nine percent of people are are really loyal to brands uh, but during the pandemic people are even more open to switching brands. So these, these charts are showing the, the percentage of people who started out uh, online looking for one thing and ended up buying from a, a different company. And we see that as the pandemic uh, progressed, that number was going up and now we're, we're seeing in some cases a, a slight decline. Uh, so this, this is important because if, if we're a brand that's not well established, this is an opportunity for us to maybe get some get some attention from people who haven't paid attention to us in the past. Uh, and no matter who we are, uh, this is important for us to remember because we need to be framing our products in a way that's going to be relevant to our consumer and it's gonna be answering uh, the needs that they have uh, according to that hierarchy of needs. Uh, and of course, wrapped up in this is uh, matters of availability. Uh, okay, so takeaways for, for changes in uh, what's happening with product. Purchase motivations have shifted. 
Uh, and consumers are seeking products that help them feel safe, healthy, and find comfort. So what that means is uh, we need to rethink what it is that we're selling. A, a business, uh, I'm not saying that we need to completely reinvent the products or the services that we're offering, but businesses do need to, tr to, to uh, reframe those products and those services to speak to the needs that are most important to consumers right now. Uh, second, businesses should focus on their strongest products. When we're facing pressure and we have limited resources, uh, we might not be able to support everything. What's, uh, this is a good time to prune things that are, that are weaker. And finally, consumers are uncommonly open-minded right now, which represents a real opportunity, especially for, for challenger brands. Okay, next, uh, price perspective. Um, included a picture of hand sanitizer here for obvious reasons. I, I think you all have heard stories of, of price gouging and how people hoarded hand sanitizer, especially at the beginning of the pandemic, and sold it for outrageous prices. So we've got two, two opposite things happening that, that we've seen, where we have products like uh, hand sanitizer that are in really high demand and prices have gone way up, and then we have uh, other categories of, of products that have really been hurt by the pandemic and people not being able to get out and shop. Um, and they're discounting things like crazy in order to keep a little bit of money coming in. So a couple of things to, to keep in mind uh, when, when we're talking about price. Uh, one, really high prices, uh, we start getting into the territory of price gouging. And price gouging, surprisingly, is, is actually not illegal in a lot of states, but it is something that will severely damage a business's reputation. And uh, it, it's not worth, your reputation is, is the, of the most valuable thing you have as, as, a, as a brand. Okay, so uh, price gouging is not something that, that makes sense, uh, even if you have a really valuable product. You want to show respect to your customer and build some brand equity and some goodwill. Um, and then on the other end, if you're a, a, a business that's selling something that's not in demand right now, and you're in a cash crunch, uh, you, know, you might have this, this temptation to discount things in a really steep way, but we need to keep in mind that we've got to maintain a sense of value. And when we discount products, we are changing the way that consumers think about what we're selling. Uh, so if we, we are retraining people to think about how valuable uh, our product actually is. And that's not something that they're gonna easily forget when the pandemic is over. So we need to be cautious about discounting uh, much more than what we have in the past. And uh, we, we can look for uh, ways to add value to our products instead of just discounting our products. So going back to the examples from the recession, we, we saw businesses that held their prices uh, steady but they made their, their products more appealing by adding value, whether that was increasing the quality of the product or making the brand something that represented more and you know, felt more relevant to consumers. Uh, maybe, maybe we're wrapping in some additional services. Um, maybe we're creating some kind of a loyalty program or offering some kind of a, a gift incentive for a purchase. These are things that are going to be, uh, they're going to help us maintain the value of our product in a consumer's mind better than just a severe discount. Okay, so takeaways well, with what's changing with price. Unreasonably high prices will damage a business's reputation. Whether or not it's legal doesn't matter. It's not, it's not worth it for a brand. Uh, lower prices can undermine how consumers uh, perceive the value of a business's product. So it makes sense for us to think twice before we do that and to think about what other incentives we might be able to offer, like free shipping, sh free shipping or a gift or um, you know, maybe even reimagining our, our product a little bit. Something else that, that goes in with this is as we decrease our prices, we, we do need to reassure, find ways to reassure our customers of product quality because customers see that price tag as a signal of what something is actually worth, of the quality of a product. So if we are discounting, we need to go out of our way to have some other messaging that's making people feel better about what it is that they're buying and, uh, and the value of it. Um, and then finally, the point I've already made, if, uh, we're, if, if we're facing longer term pricing pressures, um, we, we need to be focused on um, maintaining or improving value, not, not just discounting, but finding ways to make our product more valuable uh, to our consumer. Okay, a place perspective. 
Uh, now, when, when I say place, if, if you're not familiar with the, the four P's or haven't studied marketing, place is, is just where, where is the, the customer doing business with us? So it can be a physical place, it can be an online place, um, and it's also everything that has to happen in order for a customer to get the product from us when they want it and, and where they want it. So supply chain too. Okay, so uh, a lot of impact when it comes to, to place in, in the pandemic. So this is some, uh, some market research from a company called Numerator. They do uh, lots of surveying and keeping track of, of sales data across many different industries. Uh, and as you can see, what, what we're observing is that people are changing their behavior in really dramatic ways. They're shopping in places where they don't normally shop. Um, and they're, they're making purchases online in particular that they, that they probably wouldn't have, have done before. Okay, so that's significant for any business to be paying attention to. And then this is interesting too. So this is research about how people think they're going to respond, what they're going to do when the pandemic is over. And what we see uh, in, in the yellow, people are anticipating that they're going to do about the same amount of, of that activity. Green, we're going to do more. And red, we're going to do less. And as you, as you can see, and this is pretty startling if, if for a lot of businesses, for almost all these activities, people are planning to do it less. Okay, so it, going, going out to a coffee shop, going to a restaurant, going to a shopping mall, traveling, movie theaters, uh, people are fundamentally reevaluating the way that they spend their time and money and, and how they do that. That's going to have really big consequences for all kinds of businesses. And it means that we're going to, businesses are going to need to think about how we can create a new place to meet a consumer. And that place is usually going to be online uh, or through a phone. Okay, so habits are being created today and they will last beyond the current situation. This is a quote from uh, MasterCard's president. And he's, he's using this to, to talk about what's happening with some of their payment technology, where they're seeing their touchless payment technology uh, being used about 40% more uh, since the start of the pandemic. But this is a quote that's relevant to, uh, to what we're seeing with consumer behavior in general in the pandemic. Lots of things people are starting to do, uh, they're not going to just forget once the pandemic is over. And that's certainly true about uh, shopping online. Okay, so uh, the, uh, MasterCard's president here, he's talking about touchless payments. And this is uh, the technology component beyond just being present online or being present uh, on mobile devices. This is something that businesses need to be thinking about. How can we, uh, when people are in our physical place, how can we make that experience something that makes them feel more comfortable? And part of that is looking for technology like this that's growing very rapidly during the pandemic that's uh, going to make people feel safer. Um, going along with that, uh, we've seen a big rise in businesses that are using uh, chatbots, so AI-powered chatbots during the pandemic. Uh, again, we see consumers going online to receive customer service and to buy things, and this is this is a habit that's being formed. This is not something that's going to go away post-pandemic. People are going to start expecting this type of service, even of small businesses. Um, and then just driving the point home, a, a, a disgruntled Best Buy customer, it's like the company doesn't, doesn't exist and they just have a website up and nothing underneath. So uh, he's just describing the frustration of, of dealing with the, a business that is that did not come into the, the pandemic equipped uh, to deal with, with consumers uh, remotely. Um, so again, this is a trend that is gonna continue and businesses need to start thinking really seriously and investing seriously in being able to serve customers uh, in, in non-physical places. Okay, and then finally, this is a, a point to be made about supply chain, which uh, we saw a little bit of when we were looking at how uh, businesses navigated uh, post 9-11. And one big thing that we've seen with the pandemic is that supply chains have been scrambled. We, we can't count on uh, the goods uh, you know, from, from China or from Argentina or wherever being able to be delivered when we need them or being able to produce when we need, be produced when we need them. So uh, for businesses that uh, are relying on far-flung supply chains, uh, a big implication of, of the pandemic is that 
we need to think about how we can diversify our supply chain, how we can bring our risk down. And often that's going to mean making our supply chain a little bit more local. And it may also mean that, uh, that our, our costs are gonna rise a little bit, but that's something that we're willing to sacrifice in order to uh, provide the level of um, consistency and service that our customers expect. So takeaways for Bryce. Uh, COVID-19 has accelerated the shift to doing business online. I think all of you understand that and have experienced that. Uh, that's going to mean that uh, businesses have to start implementing the tools that are necessary to do well online. So that's, that's going to be things like uh, AI and CRMs, customer relationship management platforms. Uh, most, almost all big businesses are using CRMs right now. Many small businesses are too, but if, if you're not, that's something that that's going to have to happen for you. Uh, the in-store buying experience uh, is something that is gonna have to change a little bit to make sure that people feel comfortable and safe. Again, uh, when we are talking about product, we talked about how your product is bigger than just the thing itself that you're selling, it's the total experience. So we need to think about how we can make place uh, something that's adding to the value of our product. And then finally, the importance of diverse, diversity in our suppliers and looking for ways to source from local markets. Okay, and then uh, finally, promotion perspective. So promotion is what I think most of us think of first when we think of marketing, the actual ads that we see. And I'm sure all of you are, are sick of the, the COVID-19 uh, ads and emails and all that kind of stuff that we've encountered where, where businesses are all sounding exactly the same. Okay, um, this is an example of a, a pre-pandemic ad that had to be pulled so uh, this was Mint Mobile and they had a campaign where the uh, people are, are you know, they're, they're sampling some dip at a party. They're not using chips. They're double dipping with their fingers. They're you know, having their friends sample from their fingers. Clearly, this is not an appropriate ad to be running during the coronavirus pandemic. Okay, so first implication for promotion is that we've got to be aware of our context and evaluate if what we're currently doing is still okay or if we need to we need to pull this and, and do something else. And uh, second, um, I'm, I'm already going over what I said I would, would go, so I'm not gonna play this video. Some of you may have seen this, but uh, oh, this, this will be posted after my presentation. But this is just a montage of how every single commercial right now seems to be exactly the same. And we follow this pattern of, you know, this is, these are uncertain times and uh, we're here for you. Uh, you know, what, whatever's going on, our, our brand is behind you, people are what's important, all, all these kinds of things. So we've, we've heard that. So I, I think, you know, we see these ads and a reaction is why, why are we doing this? What is the point? And what, one big thing that I want you to take away from it is that to a certain extent right now, uh, it doesn't matter so much what we're saying is that a, a business is out there and that their, their logo, their name is being seen and heard, okay? So a, a big risk is that if, if, if we pull back on marketing right now, that's not just affecting our, our sales right now in the short term, but marketing casts a shadow. Uh, and about half of our, of our advertising, uh, we, we don't realize the effect of that until a year later. Okay, so really important. If, if we as a brand or if we as a small business even cut back on our marketing right now, we are going to be paying for that later on. That's going to be a decrease in our revenue in the future because we're just not as present in consumers' minds. So yes, it's important that we're, we're saying the right thing. We're not saying something that's tone deaf and that we're saying something that is uh, you know, helping, helping, it's in line with what consumers want to hear right now. But, um, What's most important is that we're, we're there, we're present. There we go, we'll skip that one too. Okay, so going back to when, when, I, when I was talking about product and how we might need to reframe our products in terms of what's motivating purchases now, we need to be thinking about this also in terms of our communication. Okay, so our pre-pandemic communication may very well have been focused on higher order needs on Maslow's hierarchy. And those things are still important and they still add value, but we've got to make sure that our marketing messages are, are hitting those you know, 
first one, two, three motivators that people are really concerned about right now. And often those are going to be things that are tied up with uh, safety and health and wellness and feelings of comfort and stability. Um, okay, another, uh, some brands, instead of advertising, have been present in another way. So uh, the chief marketing officer at Coca-Cola, he said, we've been intentionally quiet. What is important right now is to do, not to say. And Coca-Cola's tact has been, okay, we're not going to do a lot of uh, traditional marketing right now, but we're going to be present uh, through public relations. So Coca-Cola has committed to donating um, about $100 million in support of uh, you know, helping, helping people deal with the pandemic. So uh, that's, that's attention that they're getting. And that's something that's, that's real and something that's valuable uh, to consumers. Um, they're, the brand is still out there. They're not disappearing, but they're taking a, a slightly different tact. Okay, and that's a good approach too, because research shows, shows us that consumers respond well to this. So 90% of respondents to a recent survey said that uh, they would think more favorably of a company that was helping consumers during the pandemic. And really, whether we're a company that's doing this in a charitable way, or a company that, um, you know, maybe we're taking a more traditional marketing approach, we should still be focused on how what we do can serve customers and have a little bit less of a of a you know, company focused picture as we might have ordinarily, but focus on how we are, are serving customers. That's going to help build equity, build goodwill. So key takeaways for promotion, when marketers need to adjust their messaging and align it with customers' uh, new purchase motivators. Uh, putting a hold on marketing during the pandemic is going to have a negative impact now, but also in the future. So, we need to think twice about doing that, even though a lot of businesses are facing uh, financial pressures, it's going to have a negative impact in the future if, if we cut back in a dramatic way. And then last, um, media consumption habits have changed a lot during the pandemic. I'm sure your consumption habits have changed. Maybe you're, you're streaming more, maybe you're using your phone more, uh, but before a marketer uh, right now launches any kind of campaign, uh, we need to step back and not rely on our, our assumptions about where we can find our customer, you know, what platforms they're using, what media we, we can use to reach them. But we need to do a little bit of additional research to find out, have people's habits changed? Are they present in different places than they were before? Um, that's going to be important in making sure that our messages are effective. All right, so finally, to, to tie it all up, uh, first thing, marketers uh, need to adjust products to meet consumers' primary motivations. Consumers' primary motivations have changed because of the pandemic, and that's something that's likely to continue for, uh, for quite a while. Uh, um, and health and wellness are, are coming to the forefront. We need to reframe our, our products and our messaging that way. Shift to doing business online is only going to accelerate. That means that businesses need to be paying more, paying more attention to those online tools that are gonna help them do that well. Even small businesses need to be paying attention to, do I have the right CRM? Uh, are there some basic AI tools that I can implement to better serve my, my customers online? Price changes need to increase value, okay? Uh, there's always a temptation when we're facing a recession or facing a crisis to encourage customers to come to us by, by cutting our price. But if we do that, that's limiting how consumers are gonna be thinking about us in the future. So we need to be focused on value and not just price. And then finally, promotional efforts they need to be in line with consumers' new motivations, which are the same things that we should be reframing our, our product itself around. Okay, uh, so sorry, I went, went a little bit longer than I intended to, but we, we still have time for questions and I'd, I'd love to uh, take any. That was fantastic, thank you. Um, we have actually a lot of wonderful questions, so I'm gonna try to get to as many of them as that I can. Um, so I have a, a sort of a series of, I think, four questions that are related to the unique context we find ourselves in with COVID um, and how that has impacted both advertising and sales. So I'll just do them one at a time. I won't make you hold them in your head. Does that sound good? Sounds good. Okay. Um, so my first one is how are companies speaking about um, safety and the steps they are taking to keep their customers 
and workers safe? How are they communicating that information? And is that important to um, maintaining sales during a time like this? Yeah, I think that is really important. I think how it's communicated is going to be different depending on the, the product that we're talking about. You know, something that we're buying in the grocery store is going to be a lot different than, you know, the pants that we're buying online. Uh, but uh, something that we saw in the recession and something that we, we see now too is that customers are much more in tune with uh, the functional aspects of a product and they're much more in tune with, with uh, they're, they're, they're paying much more attention to details. Okay, so comparative shopping, uh, in, the, in the sense of the recession, it was comparative shopping just based on price, but right now because we're so focused on, on health, there's comparative shopping there too. So we are in a recession right now and we are in a health crisis. So it, it is really important that uh, brands look for ways to be as tra transparent as they can be and to give customers as much information as they can. And we saw some examples of that. So like the, uh, uh, the, the scooter delivery uh, example that I used, you know, that's pretty detailed information where we're providing temperature of, of the chef and the, the kitchen staff but that's the kind of stuff that consumers are wanting and it may seem over the top, but that's, uh, that's going to be an advantage to us. That's going to set us apart from our competition and it's worth taking the time to invest in. Okay, great. Um, and my second interrelated one, there have been companies who have changed what they're making. They've changed their product. So instead of making what they usually make, they're making PPE, for example. Um, how has that affected their messaging and their sales? Yeah, that's, that's a, a great point and a, a good question. You know, uh, there, there have been a lot of winners and losers in, in, in the pandemic as far as business goes. Some businesses have, have benefited immensely. So I think the latest one, at least in, in my world, I have, a, I have a daughter. There's a huge demand for children's pools right now, and it's really hard to, to find those in the stores. Uh, but other products, you know, nobody is, is wanting to buy them. So it completely makes sense that if you're one of those business owners, you need to reframe your product, which is a theme that I was trying to uh, to hit on in, in, in this presentation. You know, um, and you know, if if your product itself just isn't relevant anymore, what are the capabilities that you have? What what are the skills that 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 your business can offer? And absolutely, if there's a way you can shift into something new, that is something that you should do. Uh, and going along with that, though, you are going to have to completely rethink your marketing because. We're, we're talking about a different product, but most important, you're, you're talking about uh, different needs that you're satisfying, different motivators that consumers are responding to. So uh, yeah, a shift into a market, a shift into a new market is more than just the new product itself, but the marketing strategy is going to have to change in a pretty dramatic way. And, and if, we, if we focus on that hierarchy of needs, that can be a really instructive place to, to come up with a strategy that makes sense. Thank you. And then I wanted to ask about restaurants in particular um, and how they've changed their approach and their marketing and how it's affecting their sales. It seems to me that perhaps they've had the most to lose in that when people go to a restaurant, they're looking for an experience and that has been completely destroyed um, by the context that we're in. So I was just sort of looking for your thoughts on how restaurants can speak or frame their way out of such a, a terrible situation that they find themselves in now. Yeah, you're right. Uh, the pe people are buying the experience. They're not just going there to buy the food. And that's not something that we can replicate online. So uh, I think for a lot of restaurants, you know, I think restaurants have done a really good job of responding to the pandemic, but reframing their products, and, and a lot of that is just happening internally, how they think about what it is that they do, that's going to be essential. So. Uh, one example that, that I read about, there's a restaurant called Smash Burger, and they, they have emphasized uh, these meal kits that they've created in the pandemic. So they're, you know, this isn't a high-end restaurant, but they're, they're putting together these kits where, you know, there's all the ingredients that you need, all of uh, the instructions that you need, and you can, you can recreate that Smash Burger experience yourself in your home. And that's not something that they were doing before, but they're realizing that the circumstances they're facing are, are different. Uh, so I think, I think that's part of it. And I, I think also a, attention to that online experience and the, the customer service side is, is going to be really important too. I know um, a lot of businesses, even a, a lot of restaurants, even, you know, you know, smaller ones, not national brands have 
found ways to use things like um, chatbots on Facebook where, can, where customers can get uh, instant service. You know, they, they can uh, submit their order and get, have questions answered. And you know, that's all happening in real time. We're not having to wait for uh, the staff that's probably overloaded trying to deal with whatever, whatever's happening uh, in the kitchen. So yeah, I think, I think those two things, reframing what the experience is uh, and, and trying to spin that in a positive way and then uh, increased uh, attention to customer service, realizing that's gonna be something that happens virtually. Those are great examples. Um, so when I think of ads that I've seen, um, I think mostly of the cheesy ones that you were speaking of there at, at the end. And I also think of them from big corporations and companies. Um, what's the difference between the marketing messaging that's happening right now from those sorts of sources versus small businesses who perhaps the stakes are highest for right now? I think the biggest difference is, is, is a marketing budget. <laughs> I mean, that, that's obvious, but, you know, small businesses that they're pre pandemic, they weren't spending, they weren't present in those places, in those, those, uh, mass marketplaces, they weren't spending money in the same way. So. Uh, their marketing response is going to be much more focused on social media. And in some ways, that's a, an advantage because you can be really nimble there and uh, you can experiment a little bit and the, the stakes are, are not as high in terms of, of cost. That's true. And I hadn't thought of it that way. Um, we have a, a nuts and bolts question. How is consumer confidence calculated? You know, I, I don't know that well enough to, that's, that's an economics, that's an economist question. <laughs> uh, that's an econ question. Yeah, but it's, okay. it's, it's based on, on national surveys and there's some other factors that go into it. Uh, I'm not going to attempt to break it down and, and get it wrong. But basically you ask people on a survey and that's how you get the information. Yes. Okay, fair enough. What percentage, I mean, so when you consider what you said about the fact that people don't switch uh, or people do switch brands a lot. They're not that loyal to brands um, mm -hmm. and uh, people have less money right now. I mean, it seems to me with marketing, there's a really tiny percentage that you can control that you can sort of move the needle a little bit. There's all these other variables and factors that are pushing how many, how much sales you're going to get more than marketing. How, what amount, what's the threshold that marketing can control in any circumstance versus a circumstance like what's happening now? Hmm. Yeah, well, that's, that's a good question. Um, it's, it's tricky to answer because every industry is, is different. So, uh, for example, uh, the stuff that you see in the grocery store, the, those brands spend more than anybody else uh, on marketing you know, because, because, because their brand is really all that differentiates them. You know, when we have... Uh, four kinds of peanut butter that are essentially just peanut butter, the brand becomes really, really important. And the marketing becomes really important because that's, that's what you're selling. Uh, but in other circumstances, it, it's, not, uh, it, it's, not as, it's not quite as key. It's not as, as much of an investment uh, from the company. Um, so yeah, the, the dollar figures are gonna be, gonna be different for, for each industry, but uh, it, it is, it, it, marketing is a really, really key part of keeping people coming in uh, to, your, to your funnel, even if those aren't uh, loyal customers. So you're right. You now I pointed out that only about 8% pre-pandemic, only about 8% of people were loyal to brands and that's gonna be even lower now. But, but that I think puts even more emphasis on the importance of marketing because we're constantly having to find new customers. And sure, some people are going to find us naturally and through word of mouth, uh, but more people are, are going to find us through uh, the effort that we're taking to make sure that, that our brand, our business is, is out in front of them and that they're, they're hearing about us. So one, one of the things that I'll say about that is we, uh, I, I pointed out that there's a, a shadow for marketing. So if, if we cut our marketing budget now, we're going to have a downside later on. And uh, Part, part of what's happening there is that people need to hear our message many times before they start paying attention to it. Okay, so the, 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 the standard benchmark or uh, the, the, the rule in marketing usually is that people need to hear your, your message about seven times before it even registers that they've heard something from you. Okay, so uh, spending on marketing can often feel frustrating and often difficult to measure, but 
the more we do it and the more we invest in it, the more people are paying attention and the more benefit it's gonna yield for us later on. So last question. I, uh, the, the, what I know about marketing is limited to a few episodes of Mad Men. Um, <laughs> I don't even know if this question um, fits, so you can tell me whether it does or not. But with your experience in marketing, um, I wonder if you can tell me what's the mood like in a room where people are talking about how do we, how do how do we do this? How do we market our product? Um, what's the normal mood versus what's the mood in a time of crisis? What sort of things are people talking about when they're trying to decide how to promote themselves during difficult times? Yeah, that's a, a good question. Um, so actually a couple of weeks ago, I got to attend the, it was supposed to be a, a conference, but it was a virtual conference where, uh, where ad agency industry people were gathering and they were talking about that exactly, like how, how does marketing change in, in this context? And I, I think what I took away from it was that people are, are more energized, people working in marketing are more energized by this moment than, than they were about their jobs before. And they, usually marketing people are excited about what they're doing, they're, they're creative, they're, they're into it, and they're really interested in learning about consumers. Uh, but right now with the extra sense of urgency and the, the sense that uh, people's, the success and failure of business is riding on this moment, uh, I, I think there, there's a lot of energy, there's a lot of excitement and a feeling that, okay, our, our expertise is really valuable here and we have a, a moment to do something that's, that's worthwhile. So I, I, think, uh, I think people are excited about it and you know, uncertain because it's, it's an uncertain time and we don't know exactly what's gonna work and, and what's not. But uh, I, I think marketing people in general are, are energized by these kinds of things where there's a challenge that other people feel like they couldn't, couldn't solve. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Volrath, for sharing your time and knowledge with us. And thank you to the audience for joining us and asking excellent questions. The audience seemed to really love the session. Don't forget that you can continue your conversations on the Facebook group. Another way to continue the conversation is the Meet the Prof sessions. Students who have registered for course credit can join us Thursday at 4 p.m. in Blackboard Collaborate. Community members can join us at noon on Friday in Blackboard Collaborate. RSVP links will be provided. If you have any questions, please contact COVID class coordinator at owu edu and we'll see you again on wednesday at 4 p.m for international and global economic aspects of covid19 where are we and where do we go with dr safe Raman. thank you <laughs>